Buongiorno o buonasera, uh, sono Daniela Bini e vi parlo da Austin, Texas, purtroppo. Uh, avrei preferito ovviamente essere lì. Innanzitutto vorrei ringraziare Alberto, Jessica, Marco e il mio vecchio amico Luca per essere riusciti a organizzare questo convegno malgrado le grandi difficoltà incontrate. Sarebbe stato più bello trovarci tutti a Toronto, ma almeno avete salvato il convegno. Grazie. Il titolo della mia presentazione è Il libro dei sogni, Fellini's Dreams and Nightmares, ed è parte di un capitolo del mio forthcoming book. E per questo vorrei scusarmi già dall'inizio per la conclusione un po' brusca, dato che qui non sono riuscita ovviamente a sviluppare il tema come invece ho cercato di fare nel capitolo. And here we go. It was Ernst Bernhard, the German Jungian psychologist, who advised Fellini to record his dreams. Il Libro dei Sogni, which came out in 2007, is a collection of Federico's dreams over the arc of 30 years, almost. Given his drawing skills, he accompanied almost each written description of the dream with sketches. Fellini had first met Bernhard in 1952 when he was shooting Lo Sceico Bianco. But from 1960 until the doctor's death in June 1965, Federico frequented him regularly. He, although he never admitted that he was a patient of Dr. Bernhard, and only said that he had interesting talks with him and they would go out together for pizza sometimes, Kedzic, his biographer, thought otherwise. He also revealed that before meeting Bernhard, Federico was in the care of a Freudian analyst for a short time. After La Strada, Fellini entered a phase of depression and it was Giulietta who asked for the help of Emilio Servadio, the most important Freudian of the time. But Federico was not happy with Servadio's approach and instead fell in love with Bernard. They might have gone out to eat pizza together, Kedzic comments, but the relationship with Bernard was a regular cycle of analysis that lasted four or five years, three times a week, and they was paid because Bernard was very attentive about money. There was, there, theirs was not a conversation between friends, but a professional dialogue between analyst and client, unquote. Moreover, after Bernard's death, Federico was for a year and a half in the care of Bernard's analyst widow, Dora Friedland. Bellini's fondness for Bernard owed much to the fact that he made clear to the director ideas, intuitions, feelings that he had had since a young age. He supported wholeheartedly Federico's belief that what he, he invented was more real and relevant than real events. He taught him Jung, who in contrast to Freud did not write theories nor provide answers, but as Fellini put it, and I'm quoting him, accompanies us to the threshold of the unknowable and lets us alone to see and understand. Freud, with his theories, forces you to think. Jung, instead, allows us to imagine and to dream. Of the two psychoanalysts, Jung is certainly more congenial, more of a friend, more nourishing for those who want to fulfill themselves in the creative, fantastic dimension." Unquote. And he was certainly more congenial in his traditional view of marriage. In his asset, marriage as a psychological relationship, Jung describes it as a relationship between a stronger and a weaker personality, where the former is clearly the male. Moreover, Fellini states, man is not basically a monogamous animal, and here by man he means really male. And he continued, marriage is tyranny, a violation and mortification of man's natural instincts. A woman, on the other hand, tends to create a world around one man, unquote. 
These statements seem in line with Camille Paglia's belief that gives to this view her explanation. And I'm quoting Paglia now. Male sex is quest, romance, exploration, and speculation. Promiscuity in men may cheapen love or sharpen thought. Promiscuity in women is illness, a leakage of identity. In judiciously withholding herself, woman protects an invisible fetus. Now you don't have to agree with her. In an interview with Liselot Milauer, Federico commented on the oppression of the Catholic Church in matter of sex. And I'm quoting him. The giant women with voluminous breasts and huge thighs also embodied desire. Italian men suffer for centuries, traumatized by the fact that sexuality was crucified as a major sin. The result is an exaggerated appetite for all that is female, unquote. How could, how well could Federico diagnose men's obsessive desire for women as a result of culture? Why didn't he do the same when talking about women's monogamy? Giulietta often appears in Federico's dreams and the recurring themes are two. She either is the image of a saint or is very ill, close to death. In the dream of January 20, 1961, Giulietta sta morendo, and now all the Italian is of course Fellini's. È nella camera dei tremi, e di là nel soggiorno sono arrivate sua madre e le sorelle, alle quali non so più nascondere la verità. Giulietta muore, dico, singhiozzando. E torno da lei schiantato dal dolore e dalla paura. Giulietta giace su di un materasso disteso sul pavimento. È come una santa monachina, pronta a raggiungere il suo Dio creatore. Unquote. Is Federico trying to interpret the way she feels considered by him? The dream continues with Federico's tears and remorse for the pains he caused her. Abbracciavo piangendo Giulietta, la baciavo invocando il suo nome, chiedendole perdono per il male che le avevo fatto, per non aver capito mai quale insostituibile tesoro fosse per me. Ed ora se ne andava per sempre, restavo solo, nota, scrivendo queste ultime righe, non riesco a trattenerle le lacrime. Ancora. At times, Giulietta appears in the dreams upset at Federico's betrayals. Giulietta strilla che la storia con A deve finire. Nel sonno pensavo che Giulietta aveva ragione. È arrivato il momento di chiudere, di chiudere il rapporto con la P. Ma nello stesso tempo sento che non sono pronto. Non ho la forza, il coraggio di farlo. Unquote. A and P, two women with whom Federico probably had affairs. Affairs, however, they never threatened his marriage because he could never have been comfortable living next to an erotic woman. In a certain way, he felt for them a similar attraction to the one he described at the sexual initiation of his youth in brothels. The attraction for, and here I'm just quoting him, the whiff of sulfur in the strange light from hell. Unquote. By the way, he considered the initiation in brothels far superior and more exciting than today's with the present relaxation of sexual mores. Remorse torments him in many of his dreams. Giulietta è ammalata, ha un tumore, pochi mesi di vita, che pena, che fatica trascrivere questo sogno. Le angosce e i rimorsi di sempre e all'improvviso si brinda con lo champagne. Tumore e champagne, morte e brindisi augurale, come si festeggiasse non una morte ma una nascita. Unquote. The note he writes immediately after this sentence is a wish for rationalization. Forse il senso del sogno è proprio questo, morte della fase Giulietta rimorso e nascita di una nuova fase. Ah, come sarei felice. Unquote. In another dream, Giulietta is dead, 
She's laying in the casket. Le hanno fatto l'iniezione per addormentarla, così il trapasso avverrà senza coscienza. È sdraiata nella bara, le trecce bionde, in testa una coroncina da reginella di burattini. E now a few words about Federico's female myth, Anita Egbert. Anita, in La Dolce Vita and the Temptation of Dr. Antonio, an episode from Boccaccio 70, is the best example of all female qualities combined. She is a pre-Christian divinity, the Mediterranean great mother. Fellini was clearly smitten by Anita from the first moment he saw her. And listen to this quote. Quel senso di meraviglia, di stupor rapito, di incredulità che si prova davanti alle creature eccezionali come la giraffa, l'elefante, il baobab. Lo riprovai quando nel giardino dell'hotel de la Ville la vidi avanzare verso di me, preceduta, seguita, affiancata da tre o quattro ometti, il marito, gli agenti, che sparivano come ombre attorno alla luna di una sorgente luminosa. Sostengo che la Egbert, oltretutto, è anche fosforescente. Anita is a pagan goddess. She is the archaic earth mother in whom fertility, sexuality, maternal erotic power coexist, as Marcello tells her when they dance together in the famous scene in the nightclub. And I'm quoting him. You are everything. You are the first woman of the first day of creation. You are the mother, the sister, the lover, the friend, the angel, the earth, the devil, the home. Yes, that is it. You are the home, unquote. In the nightclub scene, she does not talk. She dances constantly, naturally, joyously, as a child would do, inviting everybody to join her. She's life in its simplest expression, its origin, water, where she bathes in the iconic scene of the Trevi Fountain. Water keeps cascading on her beautiful body, but it stops as soon as Marcello enters the fountain. Man does not belong to her world and has no access to it. Anita remained an important presence in Fellini's imagination. In the filmy clowns made for television, the director had her appear totally out of context when visiting the circus, they are looking at the tiger in the cage. Fellini juxtaposes the image of the head of the ferocious animal to the provocative face of Anita as they both open their threatening, voracious mouths. Woman, Fellini said, remains in that precise place within men where darkness begins. Talking about women means talking about the darkest part of ourselves, the underdeveloped part, the true mystery within, unquote. The, this part in man is what Jung called animus, I, I'm sorry, anima, the feminine, the mother's projection in all men which is an element of the unconscious. Women also have a masculine hidden element, a projection of the father, the young Jung calls animus. The interesting aspect of this discussion, however, is the following. Animus means mind or spirit. It corresponds to the paternal logos, as anima corresponds to the maternal eros. Unquote. Jung therefore established the feminine nature of eroticism and the masculine essence of rationality, furthering the Aristotelian opposition of male spirit and female matter. Catholicism did the rest, dividing the female principle into the asexual Madonna and the erotic whore. In City of Women, Fellini's failures to penetrate, woman, penetrate woman's mystery is confirmed. Rather than an attack on feminism, the film is much more a recognition of man's failure to understand women, as the director himself claimed. 
In spite of its ridiculous depiction of the feminist meetings, our male protagonist is the loser. Moreover, those absurd situations are all in Snapperat's psyche as we discover at the end that the entire story had, it was his dream. His search for the ideal woman, a combination of Madonna and whore, ends in failure. He had climbed in the hot air balloon attached to the big doll to represent his ideal female, flying high in the air, and is shut down by a real woman who shows him the absurdity of his dream. In the conclusion of the film, we see in the train compartment where our protagonist had fallen asleep, the important women who had appeared in his dream. They represent different categories. There is his wife, the feminist whom he had followed off the train, and two students who in the dream had acted as his, his guides. Smiling, Snapperat closes his eyes again and gets back to the darkness of his psyche. The last image in the film mirrors the beginning with the train going back into the womb tunnel. There is no growth, no, develop, no development in our protagonist. In spite or better because of Fellini fixation with female bosom and even more buttocks, his many drawings and filmic images of naked women, he remained a Catholic Jungian product. From Jung, he maintained that the female image was the great mother, capable of love, but also of destruction. And from Catholicism, a whiff of sulfur from the erotic female. Many of his provocative, uh, physically exuberant female disturb rather than attract. When they do not disturb, they have a challenging and ambiguous air that threatens the male gaze as the woman on the train in City of Women. For the most part, the humor of Federico's drawings of women resides in the grotesque, excessive, ridiculous characteristics he gives them. They are caricatures of women. Humor, however, may also cover up fear or inadequacy. And there are enough elements in his work and his words that prove fear or at least inadequacy. Although he denies its truth, Kedzic reports the rumor that was repeated throughout Rome's movie community of the director's sexual inadequacy. It makes one wonder, however, why Fellini would enjoy the part of the great seducer that he really wasn't. And this is Kedzic. Why, while directing La Dolce Vita, when a friend kept haranguing him to reveal whether he had sex with Anita Egbert, he did reply, you should certainly please tell everyone that I have. It is hard to establish how many of the images Fellini drew in his Libro dei Sogni were based on real dreams or invented ones, which can be even more revealing. On October 20, in 1961, for example, he drew and described with a long paragraph a dream he had. And I'm gonna stop for a second. Now I hope you can see the images. Let me share the screen. Here it is. Okay. Sogno, prigioniero Miss Pell in un castello cinese abitato da espertissime prostitute. Queste terre sono ferocemente sadiche e conoscono l'arte più raffinata di giochi d'amore fantasiosi e crudeli. Le sento intorno a me, potenti e infide come belve. Sento l'alito caldo delle loro bocche affamate. Mi mordono le spalle, un braccio, con lampi fugaci di sorrisi taglienti. Balenii negli occhi torbidi. Giocano, scherzano. Arriva Leopoldo Trieste spaventatissimo. Scappa, mi dice. Ti mangiano vivo, ma io continuo a duellare con le prostitute. Sono convinto che è tutto un gioco, anche se violento, pericoloso. 
ma infine per riuscire a fuggire con Leopoldo devo sostenere una vera lotta a colpi di frusta, a calci, a morsi. Mi accanisco violentemente contro le loro schiene morbide sui loro vasti sederi. Esco dal castello con la vergognosa impressione di aver esagerato. Sono stato vile a trattar così delle povere puttane. Forse loro giocavano, volevano solo eccitarmi per farmi fare l'amore. Well, I'm going to leave this like this because then we have to get to the next one. So I prefer that you see the images without me having to go back to share screen every time. Asleep or awake, sex was an obsession for Federico, often associated with danger and evil. Was it because of a fear or of inadequacy? Was it his Catholic upbringing? After all, he chose a serious Catholic for a wife. And in spite of attacking the Catholic education in his films, Amarcor, Roma, or Juliet of the Spirits, in interviews, he could not completely free himself from it. When he thought of a new film, Fellini would start drawing buttocks and bosoms. It was his natural reaction to a cre creative idea. They are of an enormous size and represent the power they exerted on him. He claimed they expressed his desire for unity with the maternal, the origin, but in their brutality, they also reveal Fellini's difficulty in dealing with it. Thus, the obsessive repetition of these images and their recurrent appearance in his dreams. Even beautiful Anita Egbert becomes a monster in the drawing, the direct, the drawings actually, the director made while working on La Dolce Vita and the Temptations of Dr. Antonio. In a drawing of La Dolce Vita, and here we are, Anita, ready for a tour of St. Peter, is wearing a tight dress that imitates a clerical suit. Her vulgar expression and her exaggerated shape make her look more like the famous prostitute Saragina than the fabulous sexy Anita of La Dolce Vita. Hanging from her shoulder, Fellini drew a black cape resembling the wings of an ominous, ominous bat. In the drawing for the second film, instead, and you have it on the left. She squeezes a minuscule Dr. Antonio between her gigantic breasts. The drawings are certainly humorous, especially the second one, though in, a, in bad taste. Fellini made many drawings of female for city of women. Large women depicted from behind are endowed with enormous buttocks, some in crawling position. The drawing of Donatella, one of the guides who accompanies Snaporas around, shows us a terrifying face and a naked body, poised to use her enormous breasts like machine guns. Actually, they look, the, the breasts look like bullets. Fellini did not utilize many of his drawings. He needed them for inspiration to stimulate his imagination. And they are disturbing. I think I can stop sharing. In his Lacanian reading of Fellini, Fabio Vighi argues that the core of his cinema, and of cinema in general, probably also of literature, is an attempt to keep the real at a safe distance. As a fantasy screen, its immediate aim is to safeguard and perpetuate its own logic, which is the logic of desire, unquote. The real is here the desire object, that by being constantly distanced, keeps the desire alive. And Vigi not only sees this mechanism at work in Fellini's films, but also in his life. Noting that Giulietta is the clear opposite of what Federico considered a desirable female, Vigi writes, and I'm quoting, what if the vital strategic function of a wife who does not fully fit the husband's fantasy scenario is, as it were, to keep the latter alive but denying the possibility of its concrete realization? 
What If by Marion Mazina, Fellini's secret aim was to strengthen its potential for pseudo transgression in fantasy film without, however, risking the confrontation with the object cause of desire itself, since the place was already occupied by his life companion. To film, we can certainly add drawing, since it is in those notebooks that the obsessions with those female bodies is even more evident. And in them, it is also evi evident, I add, that it is an obsession that is accompanied by dread. Very rarely, in fact, we find a voluptuous body that is not also repulsive or threatening. And such interpretation would also explain Federico's various brief affairs with the voluptuous females of his dreams. And I would like to end and to conclude with Fellini's words. Man has always been afraid of woman because she comes to him as a mystery, totally different. The reason is that all major religions, but most of all the Christian religions, have portrayed woman at the extremes of profound darkness and light, but, no, but in no middle ground. Man is confused. Woman is mother and sister, love and muse, She's advisor, angel, Madonna, and Dante's Beatrice in the light. In the darkness, she's a whore, devil, evil, destroyer, disease, witch, a temptation. A man, half scared and half fascinated, gets lost between these extremes. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>